continuing Plutarch Slides, translated by John Dryden, revised by Arthur Hugh Clough. We are furthering our look into Amelius Paulus, and I'm not sure exactly where we stopped in this paragraph, of the daughters of Amelius. One was married to the son of Cato, the other to Alias to Barrow, a most worthy man, and the one Roman who best succeeded in combining liberal habits with poverty, for there were sixteen dear relations, all of them of the family of Alii, possessed of but one farm, which sufficed them all, whilst one small house or other cottage contained them, their numerous offspring and their wives, amongst whom was the daughter of Amelius, who, although her father had been twice consul and had twice triumphed, was not ashamed of her husband's poverty, but proud of his virtue that kept him poor. Far otherwise it is with the brothers and relations of this age, who, unless whole tracts of land are at least walls and rivers, part their inheritances and keep them at a distance, never cease from mutual quarrels. History suggests a variety of good counsel of this sort. By the way, to those who desire to learn and improve, to proceed, Amelius, being chosen consul, waged war with the Ligurians, or Ligustines, a people near the Alps. They were a bold and warlike nation, and their neighborhood to the Romans had begun to give them skill in the arts of war. They occupy the further parts of Italy, ending under the Alps, and those parts of the Alps themselves, which are washed by the Tuscan Sea and face toward Africa, mingled there with Gauls and Iberians of the coast. Besides, at that time, they had turned their thoughts to the seas and sailing as far as the pillars of Hercules, and light vessels fitted for that purpose, robbed and destroyed all that trafficked in those parts. They, with an army of forty thousand, waited the coming of Amelius, who brought with him not above eight thousand, so that the enemy was five to one when they engaged. Yet he vanquished and put them to flight forcing them to retire into their walled towns, and in this condition offered them fair conditions of accommodation, it being the policy of the Romans not utterly to destroy the Ligurians, because they were a sort of guard and bulwark against the frequent attempts of the Gauls to overrun Italy. Trusting wholly, therefore, to Amelius, they delivered up their towns and, shipping into his hands, he, at the utmost, raised only the fortifications and delivered the towns to them again, but took away all their shipping with him, leaving them no vessels bigger than those of three oars, and set at liberty great numbers of prisoners they had taken both by sea and land, strangers as well as Romans. These were the acts most worthy of remark in his first consulship. Afterwards he frequently intimated his desire of being a second-time consul, and was once candidate, but meeting with a repulse and being passed by, he gave up all thought of it and devoted himself to his duties as augur and to the education of his children, whom he not only brought up as he himself had been in the Roman and ancient discipline, but also with unusual zeal in that of Greece. For this purpose, he not only procured masters to teach them grammar, logic, and rhetoric, but had for them also preceptors in modeling and drawing managers of horses and dogs and instructors in field sports, all from Greece. And if he was not hindered by public affairs, he himself would be with them at their studies and see them perform their exercises, being the most affectionate father in Rome. This was 
the time in public matters when the Romans were engaged in war with Perseus, king of the Macedonians, and great complaints were made of their commanders, who either through their want of skill or courage were conducting matters so shamefully that they did less hurt to the enemy than they received from him. They, that not long before had forced Antiochus the Great to quit the rest of Asia, not the same as any definition of the continent of Asia, but uh, to retire beyond Mount Taurus and to combine himself to Syria, glad to buy his peace with 15,000 talents. Isn't a talent like a child's weight or something, like 100 pounds or something? Um, or a small woman's weight? Um, they, that not, I forget the exact measure, what is it, 44 kilos or something, um, they, that not long since, had vanquished King Philip in Thessaly, and freed the Greeks from the Macedonian yoke. They had overcome Hannibal himself, who far surpassed all kings in daring and power, thought it scorned that Perseus should think himself an enemy fit to match the Romans, and to be able to wage war with them so long on equal terms, with the remainder only of his father's routed forces, not being aware that Philip, after his defeat, had greatly improved both the strength and discipline of the Macedonian army, to make which appear, I shall briefly recount the story from the beginning. Antigonus, the most powerful among the captains and successors of Alexander, having obtained for himself and his posterity the title of king, had a son named Demetrius, father to Antigonus, called Gonatus. He had a son called Demetrius, who, reigning some short time, died and left a son called Philip, the chief men of Macedon, fearing great confusion might arise in his minority, called in Antigonus, son German, uh, oh, cousin German, to the late king, and married him to the widow, the mother of Philip. At first, they only styled him regent and general, but when they found by experience that he governed the kingdom with moderation and a general advantage, gave him the title of king. This was he that was surnamed Dawson, as if he was a great promiser and a bad performer. To him succeeded Philip, who in his youth gave great hope of equaling the best of kings, and that he one day would restore Macedon to its former state and dignity, and prove himself the one man able to check the power of the Romans, now rising and extending over the whole world, but being vanquished in a pitched battle by Titus Flaminius near Scatessa, his resolution failed, and he yielded himself and all that he had to the mercy of the Romans. Well, contented that he could escape with paying a small tribute. Yet, afterwards, recollecting himself, he bore it with great impatience, and, though he lived rather like a slave that was pleased with ease, than a man of sense and courage, while he held his kingdom at the pleasure of his conquerors, which made him turn his whole mind to war and prepare himself with as much cunning and privacy as possible. Well, at least it's coming off defensive, right? Um, to this end, he left his cities on the high roads and the sea coast ungarrisoned and almost desolate, that they might seem inconsiderable in the meantime, collecting large forces up the country and furnishing his, inlaid po his inland post, strongholds and towns with arms, money, and men fit for service. He thus provided himself for war and yet kept his preparations close. He had in his armory arms for 30,000 men in granaries and places of strength, eight 
millions of bushels of corn, and as much ready money as would defray the charge of maintaining 10,000 mercenary soldiers for 10, year, for 10 years in defense of the country. But before, but before he could put these things into motion and carry his designs into effect, he died for griefs and anguish of mind, being sensible he had put his innocent son, Demetrius, to death upon the calumnies of one that was far more guilty. Perseus, his son that survived, inherited his hatred to the Romans as well as his kingdom, but was incompetent to carry out his designs. Through want of courage and the viciousness of a character in which, among faults and diseases of various sorts, covetousness bore the chief place. There is a statement also of his not being a true-born, that the wife of King Philip took him from his mother. Knatha Mion, a woman of Argos, that earned her living as a seamstress, as soon as he was born, paused him upon her husband as her own, and this might be the chief cause of the contriving the death of Demetrius, as he might well fear that. So long, so long as there was a lawful successor in the family, there was no security that his spurious birth might not be revealed. And the, um, when we're not dealing with monotheism or even monotheistic, one of the things that happens is people end up naming their children not servant of such and such entity that we believe to be a deity, you know. Um, they actually get the name itself. Notwithstanding all this, and though his spirit was so mean and temper so sordid, yet trusting to the strength of his resources, he engaged in a war with the Romans, and for a long time maintained it, repulsing and even vanquishing some generals of consular dignity and some great armies and fleets. He routed Publius Icinius, who was the first that invaded Macedonia in a cavalry battle, slew 2,500 practiced soldiers and took 600 prisoners and surprising their fleet as they rode at anchor before Orens. He took 20 ships of burden with all their lading, sunk the rest that were freighted with corn, and besides this made himself master of four galleys with five banks of oars. He fought a second battle with Hostilius, a consular officer, as he was making his way into the country at Elemia, and forced him to retreat, and when he afterwards by stealth designed an invasion through Thessaly, challenged him to fight, which the other feared to accept, nay more to show his contempt to the Romans, and that he wanted employment as a war by the by, he made an exception an expedition against the Dardanians, in which he slew ten thousand of those barbarian people. He brought a great spoil away. He privately, moreover, solicited the Gauls, also called Besterna, a warlike nation and famous for horsemen, dwelling near the Danube, and incited the Illyrians by the means of Genthius, their king, to join with him in the war. It was also reported that the barbarians, by barbarians I mean, you know, a different type of language, right, um, allured by the promise of rewards, were to make an eruption in Italy through the lower Gaul by the shore of the Adriatic Sea. The Romans, being advertised of these things, thought it necessary no longer to choose their commanders by favor or solicitation but of their own nation to select a general of wisdom and capacity for the management of great affairs. And such was Paulus Amelius, advanced in years, being nearly threescore, yet vigorous in his own person and rich and valiant sons and sons-in-law, besides a great number of influential relations and friends, all of whom joined in urging him to yield 
to the desires of the people, who called him to the consulship. He at first manifested some shyness of the people and withdrew himself from their opportunity, professing reluctance to hold office. But when they daily came to his doors, urging him to come forth to the place of election and presenting him with the noise and clamor, he acceded to their request when he appeared amongst the candidates. It did not look as if it were to sue for the consulship, but to bring victory and success that he came down into the campus. They all received him there with such hopes and gladness, unanimously choosing him a second-time consul. Nor would they suffer the lots to be cast, as was usual to determine which province should fall to a share, but, but immediately decreed him the command of the Macedonian War. Now, I don't see the Greek, so I'm, you know, um, it is told that when he had proclaimed, been proclaimed general against Perseus, and was honorably accompanied home by great numbers of people, he found his daughter Tartia, a very little girl, weeping and taking her to him, asked her why she was crying. She, catching him about the neck and kissing him, said, O oh, father, do you not know that Perseus is dead? meaning a little dog of that name that was brought up in the house with her, to which Amalius replied, Good fortune, my daughter. I embrace the omen. This Cicero, the orator, relates in his book on divination. Now, a sage directs the oracle, doesn't consult it, so um, you can use uh, events and give them the meaning that suits your purpose rather than you you know um it was the custom for such as were chosen consuls from a stage designed for such purposes to address the people and return them thanks for their favor amelius therefore having gathered an assembly spoke and said that he sued for the first consulship because he himself stood in need of such honor but for the second because they wanted a general, upon which account he thought that there was no thanks due. If they judged they could manage the war by any other to more advantage, he would willingly yield up his charge, but if they confided in him, they were not to make themselves his colleagues in his office, or raise reports and criticize his actions, but without talking supply him with means and assistance necessary to the carrying on of the war. For if they proposed to command their own commander, they would render this expedition more ridiculous than the former. By this speech he inspired great reverence for him amongst the citizens, and great expectations of future success. All were well pleased that they had passed by such as sought to be preferred by flattery, and fixed upon a commander endued with wisdom and courage to tell them the truth. So entirely did the people of Rome that they might rule and become masters of the world, yield obedience and service to reason and superior virtue. Okay, it started as sounding, oh, they're conquering us, and, you know, but wait, that means it's possible for us to conquer everything. Um, you know, that becomes a problem, right? Um, nationalism going too far. Um, Patriotism, as you could call it, um, that Amelius, um, I mean, patriotism, nationalism, same thing, really, that Amelius setting forward to the war by a prosperous voyage and successful journey arrived with speed and safety at his camp. I attribute to good fortune, but when I see how the war under his command was brought to a happy issue, partly by his own daring boldness, partly his good counsel, partly by the ready administration of his friends, partly by the presence of mind and skill to embrace the most proper advice and extremity of danger. I cannot describe any of his remarkable and famous actions as I can those of other commanders to his so much celebrated good fortune, unless you will say that the covetousness of Perseus was the good fortune of Amelius, and 
nationalism and globalism are words that globalism implies something that nationalism doesn't necessarily imply. Um, well, global, uh, you know, it's not per se, oh, the world and, you know, you can be nationalist um, and just fo and focus on the good of your country without violating the rights of the world. Globalism implies that uh, we all have to necessarily give up something for the sake of some global whatever. Um, and not just, not some, you know, um, effort to do what's right or something, but, you know, um, well, that's something to explain a bit further elsewhere. But um, the truth is, but, but, but patriot, that implies sort of prejudice, just like globalists implies a prejudice that kind of goes against your own people. Um, sort of the psychopath versus sociopath model, but uh, a patriot isn't necessarily, you know, it's, it's, it's more than just a personal thing. So it is for both, but um, the truth is, Perseus's fear of spending his money was the destruction and utter ruin of all those splendid and great preparations with which the Macedonians were in high hopes to carry on the war with, with success. For there came at his request 10,000 horsemen of the Bastana and as many foot, who were to keep pace with them and supply their places in case of failure. All of them professed soldiers, men skilled neither in tilling of land nor in navigation of ships, nor able to get their living by grazing, but those whose only business and single art and trade it was to fight and conquer all that resisted them. Now, see, that's that's my point, um, is that you can be nationalist and have your country's interests at heart without, you know, conquering to conquer. Um, it's that you're fighting the people who are fighting you or threatening your country. It's this that, and they're not merely a threat because they're neighbors or something, you know, um, when these came into the district of Madika and encamped and mixed with the king's soldiers, being men of great stature, admirable at their exercises, great boasters and loud in their threats against their enemies. They gave new courage to the Macedonians who were ready to, think the Romans would not be able to confront them, but would be struck with terror at their looks and motions. They were so strange and so formidable to behold, and Perseus had thus encouraged his men, and elevated them with these great hopes. As soon as a thousand gold pieces were demanded for each captain, he was so amazed and beside himself at the vastness of the amount, that out of mere stinginess he drew back and let himself lose and let himself lose their assistance as if he had been some steward, not the enemy of the Romans, and would have to give an exact account of the expenses of the war to those with whom he waged it. Nay, when he had his foes as tutors to instruct him what he had to do, who besides their other preparations had a hundred thousand men drawn together and in readiness for their service, yet he that was to engage against so considerable a force, and in a war that was maintaining such numbers as this, nevertheless doled out his money, and put seals on his bags, and was as fearful of touching it as if it had belonged to some one else. And all this was done by one, not descending from Lydians or Phoenicians, but who could pretend to some share the virtues of Alexander and Philip, whom he was allied to by birth, men who conquered the world by judging that empire was not to be purchased by money, not money by empire. Certainly it became a proverb that not Philip, but his gold took the cities of Greece, and Alexander, when he undertook his expedition against the Indians, and found his Macedonians encumbered, and appearing to march heavily with the Persian spoils, first set fire to his own carriages, and thence persuaded the rest to 
imitate his example, that thus, freed, they might proceed to the war without hindrance. Whereas Perseus, abounding in wealth, would not preserve himself, his children, and his kingdom at the expense of a small part of his treasure, but chose rather to be carried away with numbers of his subjects with the name of the wealthy captive and show the Romans what great riches he had husbanded and preserved for them. For he not only played false with the Gauls and sent them away, but also after alluring Genthius, king of the Illyrians, by the hopes of 300 talents to assist him in the war, he caused the money to be counted out in the presence of his messengers, and to be sealed up, upon which Genthius, thinking himself possessed of what he desired, committed a wicked and shameful act. He seized and imprisoned the ambassador sent to him from the Romans, whence Perseus, concluding that there was no need of money to make Genthius an enemy to the Romans, but that he had given a lasting earnest of his enmity, and by his flagrant injustice sufficiently involved himself in the war, defrauded the unfortunate king of his three hundred talents, and without any concern behind him, his wife and children in a short time without uh, in a short time after carried out of their kingdom as from their nest by Lucius Anicius, who was sent against him with an army. Amelius, coming against an adversary, made light indeed of him, but admired his preparation and power, for he had four thousand horses, and not much fewer than forty thousand full-armed foot of the phalanx, and planting himself along the seaside at the foot of Mount Olympus, in ground with no access on any side, and on all sides fortified with fences and bulwarks of wood, remained in great security, thinking by delay and expense to worry out Amelius, but he, in the meantime, busy in thought, weighed all counsels and means of attack, and perceiving his soldiers from their former want of discipline, to be impatient of delay, and ready on all occasions to teach their general his duty, rebuke them, and bait them not meddle with what was not their concern, but only take care that they and their arms were in readiness, and to use their swords like Romans, when their commander should think fit to employ them. Further, he ordered that sentinels by night should watch without javelins, that thus they might be more careful and sure to resist sleep, having no arms to defend themselves against any attacks of an enemy. What most annoyed the army was the want of water, for only a little, and that foul flowed out, or rather came by drops from a spring adjoining the sea, but Amelius, considering that he was at the foot of the high and woody mountain Olympus, and conjecturing by the flourishing growth of the trees that there were springs that had their course underground, dug a great many holes and wells along the foot of the mountain, which were presently filled with pure water escaping from its confinement into the vacuum they afforded, although there are some indeed who deny that there are reservoirs of water lying ready, provided out of sight, in the places from whence springs flow, and that when they appear they merely issue and run out. On the contrary, they say, they are then formed and come into existence for the first time by the liquefaction of the surrounding matter, and that this change is caused by density and cold, when the moist vapor, by being closely pressed together, becomes fluid, as women's breasts are not like vessels full of milk, always prepared and ready to flow from them, but their nourishment being changed in their breasts is there made milk, and from thence is pressed out, in like manner, places of the earth that are cold and full of springs, do not contain any hidden waters, are receptacles, which are capable, as from a source always ready furnished, of supplying all the brooks and deep rivers, but by compressing and condensing the vapors and air, they turn them into that substance, and thus places that are dug open flow by that pressure, and afford the more water, as the breasts of women do milk by their being sucked, 
the vapor thus moistening and becoming fluid, or as ground that remains idle and undug is not capable of producing any water, whilst it wants the motion which is the cause of liquefaction. But those that assert this opinion give occasion to the doubtful to argue that on the same ground there should be no blood in living creatures, but that it must be formed by the wound, some sort of spirit or flesh being changed into a liquid and flowing matter. Moreover, they are refuted by the facts that men who dig mines either in sieges or for metals meet with rivers which are not collected by little and little, as must necessarily be, if they had their being at the very instant the earth was opened, but break out at once with violence, and upon the cutting through a rock there often gush out great quantities of water, which then as suddenly cease, but of this enough. Amelius lay still for some days, and it is said that there were never two great armies so nigh that enjoyed so much quiet. When he had tried and considered all things, he was informed that there was yet one passage left unguarded, through Paterhabia, by the temple of Apollo and the rock, gathering together more hope, gathering therefore mo more hope from the place being left defenseless than from fear from the roughness and difficulty of the passage, he proposed it for consultation amongst those that were present at the council. Scipio, surnamed Estica, son-in-law to Scipio Africanus, who afterwards was so powerful in the Senate House, was the first that offered himself to command those that should be sent to encompass the enemy. Next to him, Fabius Maximus, the eldest son of Amelius, although yet very young, offered himself with great zeal, Amelius, rejoicing, gave him not so many as Polybius states, but as Nascia himself tells us in a brief letter which he wrote to one of the kings with an account of the expedition, 3,000 Italians that were not Romans, and his left wing consisting of 5,000, talking with him besides these 120 horsemen and 200 Thracians and Cretans intermixed that Harpalus had sent. He began his journey towards the sea and encamped near the temple of Hercules, as if he designed to embark, and so to sail round and environ the enemy. But when the soldiers had supplied, and it was dark, he made the captains acquainted with his real intentions, and marching all night in the opposite direction away from the sea, till he came under the temple of Apollo. There rested his army. At this palace, Mount Olympus rises in height, more than ten furlongs, as appears by the epigram made by the man that measured it, the summit of Olympus at the site, where stands Apollo's temple, has a height a full ten furlongs, by the line and more. Ten furlongs and one hundred feet less four. Eumelus's son, Zingoras, reached the place, adieu, O king, and do thy pilgrims grace.